Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Facing My Resistance to Faith presentation, Jesus encourages us to go through the process of emotionally removing our resistance to faith in God, God's love, God's truth and God's laws, and the need to take action to develop more faith in order to use our will in a loving manner. Recorded on the 23rd of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, so for the next hour we're going to discuss this uh, topic of facing my lack of faith. But I, I would like to uh, change it a little to be go. So I'll get rid of those three words and I'll put in my resistance to faith. What I find is a lack of faith, has, is, there's no other reason for it than a person resisting it. Right? So what we need to do is face our resistance to wanting to have any faith, our resistance to the concept of faith even. So the, the question then becomes, well, what is faith? You remember some years ago I gave a talk about the subject of faith. I think it was a couple of weekends over at Mergen. Um, so it's probably about 2012 or something, 11 or something, I can't remember exactly. Um, and my suggestion is that, that you do re-look at that particular presentation. It was a presentation from memory that myself and Mary did together where she interviewed me through the process of... Do you remember that presentation? I think it was, but anyway, and my suggestion is to have a look, have a re-look at that particular presentation. But let's look at faith now from a Bible's perspective. I don't know if any of you have heard what the Bible's definition of faith is. I'll read it for you. It comes from um, Hebrews chapter eleven and verse one. So you can read that in a Bible if you want to. Faith is the assured expectation of the things hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities though not beheld. Um, Afrar in the gate of heaven defined faith. This is what he said it was. Faith is what may be called a telemicroscopic <laughs> faculty. The soul discovers in the depth of being, which, when pressed into service, penetrates and illuminates the interior darkness and enables the soul to live in the future as if that future were already present. So, so what does all that mean? <laughs> it basically means that when we have faith, it's... It's like we can see the future without being there yet. Right? So, for example, this is something that many of you need with regard to God's goodness, for example. Most of you don't believe in God's goodness. But if you had faith in God's goodness, you would, you would have a feeling that maybe God is good. And then you would live like God is good. Does that make sense? Some of you don't have faith that God wants to give you love, right? But if you, but if you did have some faith about that, you would actually believe God wants to give you love even though you have yet to receive any. Does that make sense? And then we go, well, that sounds like a really nice quality, right? Why is it that we resist the thing? What, what, why do we resist having that kind of equality? Well, I don't know if you've examined the world today, but gee, faith, faith is not a thing that's encouraged, is it? In fact, if anything, doubt <coughs> is the thing that's encouraged. And, it, and, it, and it's actually cool to be in doubt, isn't it? It's cool. Yeah. Rob, do you want to ask? Is faith something that's already in me, like a gift? Like a seed of faith or...? No, no, faith, faith is another one of these qualities that needs to be developed. Yep. 
right? So, so you could say that, it, that it's related to trust. You know, I don't know if you've noticed a child, but a child, if your child asks you, you know, Daddy, where, where do, do, are there such a thing as Martians? And you say, no, there's not. He'll believe you, right? That's what I would classify as blind trust. Because he doesn't know whether you know the truth or not, does he, at that point? Right? So this is why it becomes very important to be truthful with children. So if, daddy, if, if a child says, you know, do Martians exist? You say, you, the, the best answer would be, I don't know, son. I've never seen one. Wouldn't that be a better answer? Because it's more truthful and therefore less, less, less inclined to, to cause that child to through that trust to believe in something that it is not that that we are not certain is true or not does that make sense so what i'm suggesting there rob is that is that with regard to faith faith uh, faith and trust and other emotions like this can be quite easily destroyed in our childhood right so while they're not developed in our childhood they can be quite easily destroyed in our childhood and they often are frequently are in fact destroyed in our childhood so most most children get to 10 11 12 and they start that by this stage their desire to trust anything has has you know they've realized that you know there's just certain things you can't trust for example when when daddy says he's going to play with you tonight it's probably not going to happen right so so you know he can't trust that right so when daddy says i'm going to play with you tonight is he going to have much faith that it's occurred no particularly if daddy said that five other times and daddy's never played you follow but but right at the beginning if daddy had never played with the child and and daddy says i'm going to come home tonight and play with your son right at that point, the child has no prior knowledge or, or, or idea of whether that's going to be true or not. Does that make sense? And so it's highly likely going to trust that it's probably true if the person saying it says it lovingly and kindly and so forth. It's highly likely it's going to trust it. But then when it doesn't happen, what does it learn? It can't trust. But also, what does it learn about the future? That it can't have faith that that future will be a reality. You follow? So it learns that at a very, very young age. This is our problem. This is why we've become cynical doubters on the planet. Right? Because we've all been taught from a very young age that we, firstly, we had things happen to us where we couldn't trust, and because of the lack of trust, now we have no faith in the future either. We have no faith that it will occur sometime in the future. You follow? Now, God's not like that, of course. Everything that God says God is going to do, God does. Right? But we don't learn that as a child. We learn that, we, remember, we apply our family of origin experiences to, to, with our parents to God. So, so our family of origin, we learnt to not trust all the time and we can't have faith in all the time that it's going to work out. And so what we do is we impose that upon God. So now we believe there's no such thing as God doing it. And there's nothing going to work out with God either. We can't have faith in God. Of course, we've had no experience with God at that point. Right? only experience with our family of origin. But, but that, unfortunately, has been imposed upon God because we, we want to try to trust. And this is where we see many of you still in this cycle with your family of origin, trusting that next time they're going to be better than last time. Right? And you know why you do that? It's because you've put all the bad experiences onto God, right? and they left you with a clean slate with your family of origin, so you think, right? And so you still engage the same behaviour over and over again with your family of origin, hoping for a different result. Because all the, di the negative results get all put onto someone else or ignored altogether. You follow? Now, with regard to faith, we obviously now, as adults, have 
a deep level of resistance to faith because of all of these childhood experiences that have occurred that have caused us to neither trust nor have faith in the future events that are promised. You follow? And so, so we neither trust that anything will happen right now, nor do we have any faith that the future event will happen given the circumstances. Right? So it becomes cool to be cynical and doubt us because to us, the doubt is going to be the eventual reality. You could almost say that we have faith in cynicism. We have faith in doubt. Now, can you see that? Because it, most of the time we're proven to be right. We're proven to be right. Okay, so someone then comes along and says, hang on a sec. God's a different person than your parents. You can trust God. You can have faith in God. You can have faith in God's love. You can have faith in God's truth. You can have faith in God's laws. They're all consistent. They never, you know, it's never changeable like what it was with our parents. You know, a parents' law was always changeable, wasn't it? Just depended on how they felt one day after the other. Like one day, you know, we could have, a, we could have an ice cream. Next day, same circumstances, can't have an ice cream. Right? One day, we can, we can go out and play. Next day, we're not allowed to go out and play. And we find out after a while that, oh, if mum and dad are a bit angry of some kind or a bit upset somehow or, or some other emotion going on, then that has a severe influence on whether we get to do the things that we thought we would be able to do but are not allowed to do today, right? So, so we learn through this process that cynicism and doubt should be our reality, And for many of you, that's what it's become, your reality. All right? So why then do we become resistive to somebody telling us, well, it doesn't have to be our reality? Can you think about why? Is it Deidre? If we have the mic, stand here. Thanks, Al. Who's our mics today? Ah, Diane now. Thanks. Hi, Jesus. Um, I think that, well, f for me, because I don't want to face how I felt about that, to like the pain of that disappointment, the bizarreness, the mm -hmm. oh, like surrealness, the the confusion I must have felt, and I just don't want to feel that my parents didn't even care enough to be consistent. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's why. So, so you could say facing my resistance to faith or facing my lack of faith is going to be very, very dependent upon me facing up to some basic truths that actually one basic truth is I don't want faith anymore. All right? I don't want it anymore. Why well, don't I want it anymore? Because if I have it, I would have to feel the pain of the past experiences where I had faith and was disappointed. See, we've stored up all this disappointment and, and, and it's sadness inside of ourselves about the promises that have been made to us over years and years and years of our childhood, and let's be honest, it goes even into our adulthood, even into almost every relationship we've ever had. It goes into our relationship with our partner, doesn't it? Like quite often we get disappointed there as well. And our relationship with friends, quite often we get disappointed there too. And it, like there's so much of it, right, to feel because, it, because nobody on earth really is reliable. No one. And, and there's a good reason for that, is they're not infinite. <laughs> Therefore, they cannot be reliable. So you can't, rely, you can't rely on anyone on earth, or in the spirit world for that matter. And we don't want to feel the pain of that. The person we can rely on, God, 
we're completely ignored because if, if we feel God and we feel God is reliable, we'll have to feel all of this sadness that we've built up over years and years and years of disappointed experiences. Yvonne? <clears throat> Jesus, did you just say that you can't have faith on anybody on earth anymore or in the spirit world because they're not infinite? Yeah, like what? How does that work? every single being aside from God is going to at some point right, cause some kind of disappointment. <laughs> and particularly if they're imperfect, aren't they? If they're imperfect, if they're not perfected in love, they're definitely going to cause disappointment, are they not? Now the spirit world is filled right up to the seventh sphere with a whole heap of persons that are not perfected in love and the earth is populated by people who are not perfected in love. So, so what's going to happen under those circumstances? You're going to be let down. You're going to be let down. You're going to be disappointed. Yeah. And most of us don't want to feel the disappointment. Right? We don't want to cry about it. We don't want to experience it. We don't want to process it emotionally. And so what do we do? We decide that the best course of action is cynicism and doubt. That's the best course of action because then you don't get disappointed. Then you don't have to feel the emotions relating to your disappointment. Can you see how manipulative we are with our, like with our own emotions? We control our own emotion by avoiding something that might trigger the emotion. You follow? And, and faith will definitely trigger emotion because it would be a contrast between the faith that we have that we can trust God and all of those kind of things and, and or even just having faith causes us to realise, oh, we, we want to trust God, but hang on a sec, I can't trust God. And why do I feel I can't trust God? Because I can't trust anybody. Never could trust anybody really. Right? And there's, it begins with the family of origin and continues the majority of our life. So we have reasons for wanting to resist faith. Can you see that? The desire to resist faith. So, so for example, what do I get by saying there is no God? What do I get out of that? If we, if we go to Rachel and then... Certainty. Certainty about what though, Rachel? Well, things won't change. I won't be confronted with anything. Yep. I don't have to do anything about discovering whether there is a God or not. Once I feel that, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. I don't have to take any action. Yep. If we go across to Gary. You can break all the laws of love. You don't have to worry about any consequences. There's no God. I'm going to die. And well, there's no God. Blood. There's no laws. Yeah. You can just, so you, so if there's no laws, then there's impunity. no laws to break. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that means I'm completely free and I, free. without consequences. So eat, drink and be merry. Yeah. And then die. Tomorrow I'm going to die. Yeah, eat, drink and be merry, right? Burn out, then to fade away. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, and this generates a whole heap of behaviour, you can see, that is then justified through the belief. Can you see, we choose beliefs so that we can get away with the behaviour. You follow? That's what we do. All right. And this is a major problem for us. So the motivation, so we want to talk about the motivation we are motivated into no faith. That's, our, that's the world's motivation at the moment, isn't it? There's like a huge amount of pressure right now on you to have no faith at all. And a lot of the pressure is coming from within you. 
Because having no faith means you get away with things, you don't have to do things, you can not make decisions, you don't have to act in harmony with love, you don't have to act in harmony with truth, there's no such thing anyway. So what's the point? What's the point of doing anything other than just having a pleasurable, happy life of your own choosing, doing what you want and, you know, like they said, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow you're going to die. So there's no other motivation, is there, after that? Yep, yeah, Alan? Um, it's interesting at the last assistance group you mentioned about faith and how we see it every day in our lives. We do. And like driving your car at 100 kilometres an hour and the other car's only a metre to the other side of you at the same speed, so that's yeah. 200 kilometres an hour. 200 kilometres an hour collision course <laughs> and you have a lot of faith in that other person who's not going to cross the line, right? <laughs> You could just sneeze or change the music dial and that's, that's it, you're in the spirit world. Yeah. So I find it fascinating that faith is all around us, yet it's also like it's against us because of the, the human denial about trust. And, and So what are the things we really have faith in at this stage? And it's really quite ironic, but we have faith in the physical things. Yes, yeah. Like we have almost complete faith in physical things. Like, and I find it interesting even like most of us would, would without hesitation get in a car to drive down the road to go shopping, right? And yet there are literally, there's, like, there's hundreds of thousands of people who die every year from doing that. So, so we have faith in it even though it's not a guarantee. <laughs> you follow? It's not a guarantee that you're going to survive. There's just a high likelihood you are, right? And we go by the percentages, don't we, a lot of the times. And, we, and yet we still have faith in that. With God, God's absolute. You follow? There is no such thing as 99.9% .9 with God. It's 100% or zero. That's it, right? That's what I'd call absolute. And yet we don't have faith there. But there's a whole heap of physical things we have faith in, right? Even though that's not absolute. But because it's highly likely, we, take, we have faith in those particular processes. You, as Alan pointed out, you've put your life in danger every day, probably, for the, since the time you drove, began driving when you were, what, 16? For, mo for most of you. You put your life in danger every day and you've had total faith in it that everything would work out fine. Right. Even though the percentages say that, no, not for everyone. But you've been fine with that. Yep, Catherine? So that really means in the end we don't even have any faith or truth in ourselves do we not really we just lose no. that no but it, but it's convenient to not have faith in yourself yeah we can drive and not worry about it can't we well it's not only that we can uh, when we have we have faith in ourselves with many physical things similar to this r issue that alan raised but we don't have much faith in ourselves with anything spiritual or emotional have you noticed that like the majority of you have very little faith that if you cry that it's going to be good for you <laughs> very little faith in that right the majority of you have very little faith that if you ask god for love that you'll actually get some if it's a sincere desire right you have very little faith in that like i say anything spiritual or emotional we have very little faith in in fact we are completely unscientific when it comes to anything spiritual and emotional We put faith in imaginary things when, with spiritual and emotional issues, right? So, so, and you'd rather put your faith either in an imaginary thing or a physical thing <laughs> and not in faith in anything scientifically proven to be true when it comes to spiritual stuff or emotional stuff. You only put your faith in what you imagine to be true or want to be true, in other words, or what is true physically that you can observe through your own experience. They're the only things that you currently, generally have faith in. Isn't it true? Right? You'll get on a plane. 
nothing holding that up other than one law, the aerodynamic law. You get on that, fly the other side of the world, not a problem. Particularly if you want to go to Bali or somewhere, you know, where you might have a bit of enjoyment of something, you, you'll go. Or if you want to see a family member, you'll go. Right. Nina? So from a scientific point of view, how would one go about demonstrating the fact of emotions, you know, because this is something that I've, I've come up against and... Like I've done it thousands of times, like, I don't know if you've looked in the mirror after you've cried. But can you see all the lines disappear from your face and everything? Have you noticed that? A couple of days, uh, one day after I've cried, I've got less lines in my face than the day before. Why is that? Now, it's the best wrinkle cream out. <laughs> Uh, but 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 you don't want to cry, right? So you're not going to do that. So instead, you go and put wrinkle cream on your face, or anti-aging cream, shall I call it? <laughs> <laughs> wrinkle cream wouldn't be a very good advertisement. <laughs> so this co this causes wrinkles. No. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to do that. But but yeah, the anti-aging stuff. We'll whack that on not realising that most of our ageing is caused by emotions, or all of our ageing is caused by emotions that we're holding on to, right? And all we've got to do is release some of those emotions and you'll see it reversed. You will. But we don't even want to try to do it. Why? Why don't we want to try to do it? There's one, there's one primary reason why. Well, it's not... It's, it causes our lack of faith, but our primary reason, what is it? Laura, if we... We don't want to feel our pain. We don't want to feel pain. That's our biggest problem, isn't it? We don't want to feel pain. You'd rather put anti-aging cream on your face than cry, wouldn't you? Most people do. Crying, like, you start crying in front of somebody. You try that. You see how distressed everyone gets. Man, it's, it's full on. They, they want to take you to hospital. They want to take you to a psychologist. They want to give you a pill, want to give you a Valium or whatever, calm you down. And they, they'll do anything for you almost to, to stop you from crying. That's how much of a panic we're in about feeling one emotion. And, and then you add sexual emotions to that. Yeah, that's like, you know, you don't go there ever. Right, with anybody. So it, it, these are the problems. So the biggest problem is, so, so what, why do we have a resistance to faith? It's because having a resistance to faith helps us avoid emotion. If we had faith, we'd probably want to feel more, but resistance to faith helps us not feel more. It helps us feel less. So what's the primary reason why we resist having faith? So that we can feel less. That's our primary motivation. It's a big problem, isn't it? So I'll just write that down. Our primary motivation is to feel no pain. That's why we do it. There's our motivation. Suzanne? I've said to you before that I have a great deal of trouble crying. It's like I start to cry and I can be in a massive amount of pain and I still won't cry. Yeah, because crying is more pain. More pain than the pain, physical pain. That Did doesn't feel true to me. I feel like... No, you, you accept cry. physical pain, but you won't accept emotional pain. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Physical pain is acceptable. How many of... Like, if you go up to somebody and say, how are you today? And they say, oh, I've got a really sore neck. You, you accept that discussion, don't you? But you go up to them and say, how are you today? And they just bore, start crying in front of you. How do you feel then? It's like... <laughs> I need to do something, I need to fix this, I need to make this go away. There's an example 
of how different we see physical pain acceptable. Physical pain is okay. All of us have physical pain, right? So it's all okay. When somebody says they broke their leg and it's terribly painful, yeah, it is. <laughs> right? we, we all accept all of that. But when it comes to emotional pain, what do we do with it? So now we, we don't want to deal with emotional pain. So here I'm talking, our primary goal is to feel no, let's be more specific, emotional or spiritual pain. Yep, so Lani. You can see the difference, can't you? Physical pain, most of us accept, don't we? When I say we accept, like, we still do a fair bit to avoid it, don't we? So if I'm in some physical pain, you know, if you've got a headache, what do you do? Um, go and grab a Panadol or something, right, to, to make the headache go away. But when somebody says, I've got a headache, you go, oh, yeah, no worries, pain, fix to that, it's Panadol. Fix to that is some kind of pain reliever, right? We accept that. But when someone's crying their eyes out in front of us, most of us don't know what to do. Don't know what to say. We don't, we, we, we're in a panic. We, we, we can't cope with it. We can't even cope with someone else crying, let alone, let alone ourselves. Right? Is that because if someone has a broken leg, you know that it's going to heal and it's only temporary. But if someone's in emotional pain, we don't have faith that it's, it's going to end. And it's, it, they'll, they'll be healed after it. Is that why we panic? No, I'm saying we don't even want to have faith. I'm saying it goes even further than that. It, it, we don't even want to have faith because if they have faith, then they would feel the pain and we don't want them to feel the pain. We don't want to feel our own emotional pain. We don't want to feel our spiritual pain. We don't want to, so we don't want to have faith in any way even though the results would be that we would find some relief and get therefore the proof that our faith was worth having, we don't even want to do that because our goal is just no emotional or spiritual pain. So we don't even want to take like um, the first step to just... We don't even want to do it once and prove to ourselves that it's true. Yeah. We don't even want to do that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We don't even want to do that. We don't even want to do it properly just to prove once to us that it actually has a positive effect. Because that would be all it would take, really. It well... Would, well for, to have... Well, maybe. To have faith that it, that it works. It's a process that really works. Yeah, so true faith comes from actual experience. Isn't that not true? Like, so, so for in the child, the example I gave to Robert, the child, remember the child, the actual experience became that daddy didn't come at home and do what he said he was going to do. So, so the child learnt you can't, you can't trust daddy, what his daddy says, but the child also learnt you can't have faith in what daddy says. You can't have faith in the future of, of what dad's promises, right? That's what the child learnt because it was disappointed, right? If the experience was completely the opposite, where Daddy said, I'm coming home playing with you, son, and he came home and played with you, then what would happen? Then your faith would be validated, would it not? And therefore give you a stronger faith that next time Daddy promises he's going to play with you, he probably will. Isn't that not true? Right. Same applies here. We have to build our faith somehow, but what I'm pointing out to you is the main reason why you, your, your will is not even engaged in many ways towards God and towards the source is because you have no motivation to have any faith because if you have faith, you'll have to feel some emotional pain or spiritual pain and you don't want to. That's your motivation. That's your primary goal. Yeah, if you just come across to Glenn and to Rita on this side. <coughs> but particularly when you did cry when Dad didn't come home and you got a whack for it. Yeah, it's even worse then, of course, isn't it? Because you got belted for something that, that was a valid experience. So after a while, you learn to fear pain itself, right? And this is where many of us are now. We now fear emotional and spiritual pain 
We fear it more than we fear physical pain. That's why we tolerate physical pain. And, physical, and that's why we'll tolerate physical pain, even though physical pain is caused by emotional and spiritual pain. In other words, if we released some emotional pain, the physical pain would disappear, but we would rather have the physical pain and try to attempt to alleviate the physical pain without going into the emotional, because the emotional to us feels worse than any physical pain we can experience. And you know what? We are willing to go to hospital and die a horrific death through something like cancer rather than feel emotional pain. We are. The average person on this planet is, is okay with that. And then they go, no, it's got nothing to do with the emotion, so we tell ourselves that it's not even got anything to do with it, so that we can avoid the whole concept that maybe the cure is emotional. We even do that. Reader, thanks. <coughs> you, you just said true faith comes from actually actual experience, mm -hmm. but we haven't had an actual experience of God like no, you had in the first century when you were a child. No, but you could have. Why that? Just by choosing the one, choosing by to have a little bit of faith. Actual experience. No, choosing to have a little bit of faith initially and have the experience. It's like, it's like choosing to have a little bit of faith that emotional pain, once you experience it, will give you physical results. It will help your health. You can, you can have a little bit of faith that that's the case, right? a little bit of faith in God's goodness, that God created the system where, it's, where you can do that, and then try it out and see how it goes, and then measure the results, and that will help you build your faith. Does so it's sense? just like in the mediumship channeling that people who just suddenly realize they do want to have that faith and do pray to God. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a sudden realization. Uh, I, uh, every time I've, expa I've explained that to them, I've said, look, let's try an experiment and see what the results are. You remember that? Yeah. Every time. Yeah. And, and, and then when they see the results, that's what gives them some faith now that that is a potential truth. Now, what makes them make that original choice? They've got no faith at that point. What makes them make the original choice? They that, see others. They see the spirits in the higher oh, condition. Maybe not. Maybe not. So what makes them make the original choice? Their pain is too big. Uh, their pain makes them see some things but it doesn't make them make a choice they want to and what's that called will <laughs> will <laughs> exactly so what's our subject that we're discussing my will and can you see that you can have a will to decide to even build faith or you can have a will to resist it and most of us are choosing a will to resist it because that's normal. That's on this planet. That's normal. To have a will to resist. You follow, Laura? What's the, what's the difference between emotional and spiritual pain? Um, spiritual pain comes from what I would classify as spiritual. I feel they're very connected. But let's look at spiritual pain versus emotional pain. Spiritual pain. My belief in God structures a lot of the pain in my life. My lack of belief in God, my lack of trust in God, structures a lot of the pain in my life. Right? That's different than my interaction with, say, Peter, and he belts me in the nose, and that caused me some pain. Right? In that in the, that's an interaction that's a more of an emotional interaction that's caused me some pain, right? or some physical pain in that case. But his intent to do it would cause me the emotional pain. Why did he want to do that to me? That's my emotional pain. Right, so to to my, to my mind, the the spirit what I classify as spiritual pain has to do with your relationship with yourself, your relationship with God, your relationship to love, your relationship to truth, your relationship to God's laws. Whereas to me, a lot of them, which is all emotional, of course. So I'm not I'm not saying they're not emotional. That spiritual is not emotional, but I'm saying that a lot of our pain comes from the lack of spiritual development in our life. A lot of our emotional pain comes from that. Does that make sense? And we don't want to feel it. So, so for example, lots of you have 
extreme amounts of doubt about whether God even exists. Extreme amounts of doubt, but you don't want to feel it. Some of you, like many Christians I've met, have extreme amount of doubt about whether God exists. They don't want to feel it. You start talking about whether God exists or not, and they get militant with you. They'll even murder you just to prove that God exists. Why do they do that? Because they have extreme amounts of personal pain associated with that concept that they then have gravitated to a belief system which helps them avoid that pain. And then, But if you confront it, bang. It's automatically, automatically they're into the emotional response, right? Which demonstrates there's no love in them at all, but demonstrates their true condition, which is they also personally have an extreme amount of doubt. It's a bit like me saying to you, like, Laura, you're a lesbian, right? right? And you know you're not, right? You know that your attraction is towards the opposite sex, not the same sex. Like... If I said you're a lesbian, wouldn't bother you at all, would it? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but if you had some emotions about it, it might bother you a lot, right? It might bother you a lot then. Right? If you had emotions about same sex interactions, same sex marriage, say you know, if you had all of these kind of problems with that. Then, then you might have a huge reaction, right? If you think that God's going to kill people who have, who have same-sex relationships, you will have big problems with it. Even if you are gay, you would have huge problems with it. You follow? So what I'm suggesting is that a lot of, all of our pain that we don't want to feel has relationship to, always emotional, but it also has a relationship to our relationship with God and God's universe and God's laws and God's truth as well. Does that make sense? Now, who did I have over here? Is there somebody? No? If we go to uh, Evira and then down to Pierre. I feel like I've had enough experience now um, where my faith should be further along. Like, like I'll see something that I've done, some sin. And then I'll put myself through this grinding pain for days and days and days and days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, and then I'll have a big cry about it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, and then I think, oh, that, that wasn't as terrible as the lead up to it, right? I agree. But then the next time... <laughs> you do the same lead up again. I do the same lead up again. And yeah. even though I'm sitting there saying... Well, don't you remember the last time the, the crying wasn't as painful as the lead up? Yeah. And I'm still doing it. And I, like, I feel like maybe I'm hitting a wall of fear that I refuse to feel. Is that. We'll talk about that in another discussion when we come to, to facing our fear of emotion, right? Because that, that really applies in that discussion. So that's what's interfering with my faith being strong enough. Yes, your fear of emotion is greater than your faith in emotion. Do you follow? Your fear of emotion is greater than your faith in dealing with emotion. So it's still bigger than my faith. Yes. When your faith is bigger, you can see you'll automatically get into your emotion, right? Yeah. But if your faith is smaller... The emotion, the, the try, desire to prevent the emotion will be larger. This is why faith is such an important quality to develop and spend a lot of time developing. There's things you can do to develop it, right? Remember, faith is, faith is a part of your will, so you can develop it. You, you're allowed, you, can do, you can do things to develop your faith, the same as you can do things to develop your will. It's exactly the same principle, in fact, as developing your will. Right. So we'll go through that in a couple of days' time, how to do that. But, but at this stage, what I'm trying to point out to you is that your desire, your resistance to faith is specifically surrounding the issue that you don't want to have any. <laughs> because having some means feeling some things that you don't want to feel. Does that make sense? If you had some faith, you'd be impelled to feel it. 
So, so, so it's better to have none. That's what you think. It's better to have no faith. And the whole planet thinks it's better to have no faith, particularly when it comes to emotions. It, it thinks it's better to have no faith whatsoever. And particularly when it comes to God, it's better to have no faith at all. Right, this is why on earth it's really interesting because you know, if you ask a person what member of a religion, you know, who's a member of a religion, you know almost two-thirds of the planet will say they're a member of a religious faith. Right? So that's a lot. That's the majority, right? But you ask them whether they have confidence in God, the standard answer is going to be, oh, I don't know. I don't see how I can have confidence in God. I've never had a personal interaction with God. I don't really know whether I can have confidence in God. There's a lot of bad things that happen that I feel like blaming God for, right? The average person, even those religious people, the average one of them has no faith in God at all. You follow? Yep. So, Pierre? <coughs> um. There must be some things that keep me wanting to develop my faith, and there must be something. So I try to to have period time to experiment, and there is, and and I have a little faith in God and God's goodness, yeah. but I keep experimenting, and I notice when I kind of lie on my bed and I feel my pain and I do this kind of experiment I I hardly feel anything and I feel I, I'm forcing me into it mm. then when I go into okay I let go and I listen to seminars or I read something inspiring then then I can connect yes but when I really want to experiment, then I'm blocking, mm -hmm. and yep. then I get frustrated. Yeah. How many feel like that? Quite a lot, right? The reason why is, obviously, there's a lot of fear of emotion. Right? There's a lot of fear of emotion. There's a lot of also resistance to truth. Right? And there's also a lot of fear of taking action, which are the other aspects that we're going to discover, discuss over the next two days. So you have some faith, but again, the faith is not strong enough to motivate the truth or motivate the action or motivate feeling the emotion. You follow? So, so it's good that you're trying to develop it, but it's, but it's not yet strong enough to overcome the resistances. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is what I'm getting at with regard to this presentation, is that most of the time we, we want to avoid real faith. Because if we have real faith, we would feel more, right? So we want to avoid real faith. So what we do is we, we actually don't want faith. The opposite of what majority of people think, that they have a little bit of faith. The reality is we don't want to have any faith, right? Because having faith would actually cause us to feel things that we don't want to feel, all right? Now, a person who desires love is going to have to develop faith. And the reason why that is the case is because there's very little love or faith present on the planet. And therefore, you're going to have to have faith that something, some other being is in a better state of love than anyone here is before you will actually progress in understanding love. So the only way you can be educated in love is by actually beginning by having a bit of faith that such an education is possible from a source that's higher than yourself. You follow? Now there's plenty of things to support that belief if you allow yourself to examine them. But what I've noticed is very little, very few people on earth examine the relationship between God, creation and law and all of these other things that would give you faith. Right? Like, what, like, for instance, God's laws are so consistent that you bet your life on them. You do it over and over and over again every day. 
you bet your life on them. That's how consistent God is. Now compare that to how consistent your mother or father were or, your, or how consistent your friends are or whatever and you'll see there's no comparison. Right? There's times when you certainly wouldn't bet your life on your father or mother or your brother or sister or your friends or, or whatever or your partner even sometimes. Right? There are times when that would happen. But with God, you bet your life on it every day without thought. So there's, to me, a motivation to have some faith. Just, just that one thing. The fact that God's laws are consistent gives me faith. Right? And these are the kind of things we need to ponder about. But we don't. We don't spend any time thinking about them. Because we've been broiled in our own emotional pain, usually in the course of a day, when our, what's happening to us and all these different things. We don't give ourselves time to contemplate the truth about even God's laws. So, so therefore it has no effect on our faith. So again, we're going to have to somehow structure our life in order to contemplate these particular things. Now, in the first century, I spent a lot of time in contemplation about the things I was learning. But I noticed not many people do that. Not many people think about the things they're learning and relate it to their life in a practical sense. They just don't. It's like a scientist doing an experiment and then throwing out the results. That's what we do. We throw out the results and then the very next time we come up with the same circumstances, we're back at point one where we haven't worked out what the, you know, the, the results of the ex previous experiment we did in exactly the same way. And so we go ahead and we, do, we, we decide to either create another experiment or most of the time what we do is just feel impelled to feel no emotional or spiritual pain and we don't even do it. it not even, we don't even assist ourselves to create faith in what we've previously done will probably work again this time. We don't even do that. Right. Thanks, Linda. So... But what I'm what I'm sensing is what we really need to do is to cultivate a sense of awe and wonder in every aspect of our life. Yep. Yeah. So then it would make sense that what we need to help that along is to feel the blocks, why that sense of awe and wonder was shut down in our childhood. Correct. And if 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 you go there, most people will be crying straight away. Like, you know, most of you, when I talk to you about those particular things privately, you're crying within a few minutes. Yeah. So that's telling me that you're not allowing yourself to think about those particular things privately. Yeah. So why is it that I can sit down with you and in 10 minutes you're crying, and, 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 or even in a presentation in a, many of you start crying, but when you sit down by yourself you can't cry. Why is that? It's got, there's got to be, you must be telling yourself something different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where it gets to this next section that we're going to be going through yeah. about truth, you know, what, what, what you're actually telling yourself and why you're telling yourself these particular things. But one thing I'd like to point out is that you can see now that because we choose to have no faith, we then construct a whole heap of false belief systems to support our lack of faith. Right Now, constructing false belief systems, what's false belief systems? It's the false, we then want it to what? Appear real, right? So, f we, so we have false and we want it to appear real, right? And, w and then we wonder why we're so afraid. We're so afraid because we believe in the false. And when the false appears real to us, we're now totally confused, we're in total doubt, and we're also in total fear. Fear is false expectations appearing real. Right? The things that you believe in that are not going to happen, you think they're going to happen. Right? Your false expectations appear real to you, 
That's fear. And that's what we want. We want the false to appear real. That's what we're doing. We're constructing more fear. So we're even creating our own fear. So, so it's, not, it's not actually accurate to say that all of our fear was created in our childhood. We are actually constructively creating more fear by choosing to believe in the false and wanting it to be real only to get disappointed because it's never going to be real. And so we do the false, we do the false, only getting disappointed every single time. We're in this cycle where we just want to, we want to have the false appear real. Right? Now, constructing fear, this is what, this is what makes fear. Doing something that, where we have the illusion of it being real when actually it's wrong, where it's false, that's what creates fear. So, for example, if I said walk out in this plank and then I remove the plank from you, right, and you fell, you have no more trust in what, in what is real after that, right, with regard to that plank. Next time I say walk out in the plank, what would you do? I'm not going to move it this time. What would you do? No, you'd leave it alone probably, right? And the reason why is because... Because I have created the illusion of it being real only to take it away from you. And so now you have all this fear that comes up when you contemplate that particular thing because there's no trust in any certainty anymore. Right? You've, I've constructed your fear if I do that. I've made you more afraid. You do that to yourself all the time because you go along with your false belief systems hoping that they'll end up to be real in the end and you do it because you want to avoid some pain. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? I want to just finish off, uh, Rich. So, okay, so, so, so here we are. We're constructing a heap of false beliefs. Now, what's fear? Is fear a sin? Yes. So, so we're actually constructing sin purposefully in order to avoid emotional pain. And then we're hoping that in the result of constructing sin that we won't have more pain. And is it working? No, of course it's not. We are having more pain. This is why we're having more pain, because we keep constructing more by the choices we're making. And we do that because we don't understand will. We don't understand how to properly use our will. You see, we wouldn't do that if we understood our will, would we? we? We would go, hang on a sec, I can change all of this. I can get rid of false beliefs by feeling them. I can feel emotional pain and that is gone. It won't have an impact upon the rest of my life if I do it. And that is going to be good for me. And it's going to be good for everyone around me too, actually. All it requires of me is developing some faith that that whole process will actually work. But when I look at a child, it works for the child. He falls over, get, cries, gets up, walks again, falls over, cries, gets up, walks again, falls over, cries. Eventually, what happens is he's not falling over anymore. Why? Because he's learnt all the reasons why he fell over. And he has no more fear about walking because he's let it all go. Right? He's let it all go in the process. As it happened, he let it go. Right? And because he chose to let it go, he is now confident when he walks, that he's that, so confident that, you know, we can get to walk across a tiny little wire and still be confident. I've seen people do that, right? Where you can, I've seen builders walk across a truss where there's like they could fall to their death and they just walk there, you know, like as if they're walking just on a on the ground. That's how much confidence we get in our own ability to walk. But to get there required processing emotion. If we didn't process the emotion, we would have had so much fear that we would never have walked again. And that's what most of us are doing with our emotional life and our spiritual life. We choose to not walk again. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Well, what I'd like to do now is have a break. This break uh, is another small break, if we can, have a six minutes or so. And then we were going to discuss another aspect of facing our resistance, and that's facing our resistance to truth this time.